All right. Welcome back to the Big Board. So uh, today I thought I'd have a quick conversation with you about uh, Fall Blau, uh, this particular game here from Compass Games. I recorded a video last night that would probably in the end have been taken the wrong way as being too negative because I did spend uh, probably an inordinate amount of time on some of the aspects of the game that I felt were uh, uh, lacking. But in the end, I said, hey, look, you know, I enjoyed the game and we're planning on playing it again. But that may have got lost in the equation. So what I'm going to do is redo that uh, capsule note, if you want, on uh, the game. We had, uh, just to recap, just to kind of give you some context. So Four Blowers from Compass Games, it's based on the Victory in the West system. And that uh, system, now that I have a a little bit of fresher perspective after 11 hours or not 10 hours out of yesterday uh, has a long history and that history is you either really love the system or you despise it. Uh, there are probably 8 or 10 games out I think that have used that system. Nathan Kilgore is probably one of the biggest uh, proponents of it. Operation Typhoon is probably the biggest game you'll know from that series of games that use that system and it has some fundamental features to it like locking zones of control uh, <clears throat> a move and then a, then a secondary a move combat then a secondary move combat or overrun phase and a number of other things that are unique to it that really could have fed off of what I believe fed off of the Panzer Group of Guderian system and uh, kind of refined that and took it from there. So Fallblau relies heavily on that system and in fact the designer, and I'm gonna to have to look his name up again, and he uh, reads my blog and I feel horrible that I have forgotten his name. Is it Greg? Greg, 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 please be Greg. Gary, Greg, Gary, somebody, designer notes. I don't have the designer notes. Do I have the designer notes? Oh, sorry, dude. I do not have the designer notes, so there you go. Some nameless designer. Great game. Okay, let's get that on the table. Great game. Five players. We split the, the battlefield up because it's three maps uh, long ways next to each other and two maps sort of tacked onto the end for the Caucasus Mountains and stuff. It's dealing with the... Uh, June through December 1942 time period where there's that uh, German offensive and then the Soviet counteroffensive in the winter and all that sort of good stuff. Very, uh, very intense gameplay. And one of the things that uh, they did differently in the rules here is they introduced the supply and command constraints through uh, command point concept that allows you to activate X number of uh, formations and uh, with Panzer formations costing more than regular formations. That sounds pretty simple, right? So that helps uh, provide the ebb and flow without having to do perhaps what OCS does, which is you know, manage a bunch, of, a bunch of chits and truck them up and down the, uh, the battlefield, the back, the back uh, backfield of the battle space. So, um, With, with that concept, that's kind of a departure from the Victory in the West system, uh, that really does introduce enough tension into the game that, that you're not just moving everything and then uh, having combat and then going on. Uh, they, they really make, it, uh, make the choices difficult for the access player as uh, time progresses because you receive less and less command points. Uh, you have very restricted replacement rates and the Soviets have a much freer hand of it from what I could tell but they have less offensive capabilities until the winter offensive. We only got to turn 18 and we felt that at turn 18 through turn say 30 plus not a lot was actually going to change in terms of the activities that we were going to be conducting and the you know, the line would have just compressed around Stalingrad and, you know, the kind of minor action in the Caucasus, which I was leading, uh, would have carried on for some indefinite period of time. 
it really wasn't going to be until turn 40 or 50 or probably turn 40 thereabouts when the potential for freezes come in I think that you would have seen the the game dynamic change uh, where the Soviets were far more aggressive uh, and, and whatnot so so we decided to call it there with the view that we would set it up again and look forward to playing it again because we felt like we made a number of fundamental strategic errors a few rules errors that that caused a little anguish on both sides of the equation and uh, probably good for me to sort of talk a little bit about that and then I want to wrap up on the the couple of the negatives which are to do with components so uh, the the combat system has a number of different options for you. You can do conduct a prepared offense, you can conduct a mobile assault, you can do overruns against units that don't have zones of control. And if you're not supported, i.e. activated with a command point, then you cannot engage in combat and you can only move half your movement points. So that means you can still move stuff, but you can't do a whole lot with them. You can perhaps support blocking retreats and things like that but uh, very difficult for them to get anywhere or do very much. And I just thought of another thing I'd like to talk about, so I'm gonna cross these fingers and hope, hopefully I remember. So the, the strategic things that we did wrong, I think, were the Germans probably didn't push hard enough using mobile assaults. Uh, mobile assaults are uh, a unique combat mode that I've not actually seen before in the way they're done, uh, in that it, primarily it's forcing a defender to retreat between two and four hexes, I think it is, and then you can continue moving, and that costs you two movement points. And it's not an odds-based thing, it's based on the size of the unit you're attacking. Now, if you happen to have a significantly greater force and or use air to support that mobile assault, you get beneficial DRMs. But uh, the game itself, the, the, the action itself, can be conducted in clear terrain, uh, can be t- conducted in what they call fortified zones, but really it's t- trenches and barbed wire, so you can imagine tanks just rolling right through, that sort of stuff. So you're bouncing units out, and that would then allow other units to follow through. As you bounce a unit out, you could then follow up and attack it again with a different uh, mobile assault with a different armored unit, and literally force a, you know, a six or eight uh, hex retreat. And, and, and spread a fairly significant hole. Now, uh, uh, infantry units can also conduct those types of mobile assaults as well. So you think of it as a kind of drive up, dismount, shoot some guys, load up, keep going. You're not really trying to kill and mop up, you're trying to just blow a hole through. So we didn't do that as the Axis player at all very much until about turn six, which was too late. And once we realized that was a valuable uh, asset to be, uh, a mechanic to be used, we jumped right on it. The thing that the Soviets didn't do well or that did too much of, perhaps, was that they uh, defended forward. So perhaps they should have left some ash and trash up front to slow things down and then pulled uh, a more cohesive line back behind the, is it the Demper or the Donets, one of the two, maybe both. Uh, I think it's the Demper in the north, the Deniper in the north and the uh, Donuts in the South. Uh, They should have pulled back a little sooner because they really did end up being bled white. A very small uh, force was left. Uh, Fortunately, the replacement rate was keeping up with the losses we're inflicting for the first 10 turns, but after that, it started to tail off a little. so, so strategically, you know, we, we mismanaged some rules, uh, some DRMs, and tactically, I mean, uh, we did that, and then strategically, neither side took full advantage of their capabilities or the terrain. So it, it warrants another play to see what we would do, because I think we would have pushed, with the mobile assault being used, we would have pushed the Russians back faster, they would have retreated faster if they had to play differently. And that would have then allowed us to divert off forces uh, to the south sooner uh, to try and invest the uh, Stalingrad, great Stalingrad uh, 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 siege. So some things, you know, uh, we didn't certainly did not meet the historical gains. And now I can see how that could have happened. I can see how we could have achieved the historical gains. We had to use the rules correctly. Russian Imperial style. 
so there's that. Now we're at 10 minutes, so quick comments on uh, components. Maps, very nice. Rule book, uh, very nice. I'm not a big fan of colored paper though. I'd rather just read on black and white, please, and have color diagrams, that'd be great. But fine. Uh, lots of funky colors and patterns on the, the setup charts and the reinforcement charts that just made things awkward and Quite frankly, I felt that they were not attractive. They weren't uh, aesthetically appealing to me, so they weren't doing anything for me from an aesthetic, sta aesthetic standpoint. It kind of made everything kind of blend into a kind of smudgy looking thing, and oh, there's a unit. So I didn't like those. The counter art is fine. There is a lack of uh, information on the counters that's legible. Uh, the key information you need to keep track of which regiments belong to which panzer division is almost impossible to read for 40 and up aged people. The font is a very thin font and it's not bolded and it's very small and it's on the right hand side of the icon and it's very difficult to read. What would have been useful is perhaps two color bands or two color systems, one for the cores. Okay, we got cut off, <laughs> telephone call. Um, counters, counter arts, colors, for divisions, colors and patterns for divisions, core affiliations. That's important because your activations are driven by headquarter type and they act and, and who you activate, which commander you activate has a range and sometimes has a, a counter limitation to how many units you can actually activate. So being able to activate an entire division is far more valuable than, in, than activating a part of a division. And so you've got to look all the time and it's really important and it's a it's a huge flaw for me in terms of playability and usability now the final thing i'll say on uh components is the, the charts uh there are a couple of things that really annoy me with the charts number one there weren't enough of them there's one crt and this is really this is not a solo game uh, i probably wouldn't play this solo because i just think it's it's it, it's a fair amount of work individually I think as a group, we, we, we cranked through turns pretty quickly, but we had five players. And in nine hours, we got, so we're running, uh, we're running uh, an hour a turn. Is that right? We're running two, two, two turns an hour, basically. And we did 17 turns, so nearly two, ter nearly two turns an hour. That's with everybody moving, <coughs> moving and resolving combat as you go and doing all that sort of stuff, and then the other guys doing their thing and whatever. So, <clears throat> Sometimes, some turns took longer than others. And that was, so, so you put nine hours in, you're only uh, you know a third of the way through the game. That makes that a long game. Now, to do that by solo, you're probably punching a hundred hours up. I would say sixty, at least sixty. So, anyway, one CRT pisses me off. We're passing it backwards and forwards because we want to double check because when we're playing the game new and you, there's no. Uh, None of the modifiers for terrain are on any of the charts that I could see anywhere. They're, some of them are, some of them aren't. Uh, because you know, when you cross major rivers, you have, that's not on the that's not on the chart. I don't believe. I never. I don't think I held the chart in my hand more than two or three times, and we're so busy passing it backwards and forwards that whatever. So, you know, if I'm paying 120 bucks for a game, I want two friggin' CRTs, please. Uh, and I don't want to print one. Thanks, guys. I'm paying 120 bucks. I want two. At least, uh, there are two huge terrain effects charts on the maps, one at one end, one at the other end, and they're both oriented to face, to be read as you stand at the end of the table and look down the table and look back and back. So if you're sitting at the table, at the maps, you read it upside down. Completely useless and worthless. So no point in being there, save me half a map or a third of a map. Didn't really like that at all. Um, so the usability aspects of the game really, we felt like could have been improved upon and would have liked to have seen a more detailed, maybe a rule summary. I would have liked to have seen, uh, there's a rule summary there, but it doesn't get into some of the, the key bits and pieces that you need if you're trying to look something up real quickly. You gotta go back to the rules. Uh, I think a better index or an index would have been useful. I'm not sure if this, this has an index in it 
I don't know. I don't know what, what I would do differently about the indexing. Uh, some some things are, are in two places. You know, so you're dealing with retreats and support and supported. There's things that are kind of mismatched. But anyway, that's a really, really minor quibbles. But for 120 bucks, I expect, I expect goodness, right? Nice maps, I think I mentioned that already. And now that my phone rang and I had to pick it up, I forgot why I had my fingers crossed. I'm sure it was really important. I may think of it in a second. But anyway, we're gonna play it again. We enjoyed it and we all felt that it was a very easy uh, game to, generally speaking, to grasp once you've got your hands on the game and started interacting with it. It's one thing to read the rules. You read the rules and go, yeah, I got it. Another thing to actually start pushing the pieces around and there's a few nuances that you really need to pay attention to in terms of who you're activating, when you move and how you move. Uh, you know, when you start moving pieces, you've got to keep track of where your HQ was or is so that you can activate in that inside that range. Uh, and then, but you've also got to plan where that headquarters is going to end up for the next time you activate. So some sort of counter or we use poker chips just to you know, keep a, a, a reminder of where, he, of where he was and then move him up so you can see how far forward you can actually be. We ended up doing a lot of, you know, moving and going, oh shit, well I want to move that guy next turn so I got to pull him back a little bit uh, because the, the commander couldn't get as far as you wanted him to. So uh, there's, there's, there's a lot to be thought about in the game. It's a little bit of a thinking game, a little bit of a planning game. The action comes fast and easy, I think. Uh, the combats are resolved very, very quickly, assuming you do them right most of the time. Uh, the Soviets didn't attack very much at all. The guy that fought me... Uh, Gary <clears throat> made six attacks and only one of them was successful and he got his ass handed to him uh, with A1, A2 results on a regular basis and learned the hard way that it's probably not smart to be attacking in the early game unless you have overwhelming odds and you can actually guarantee yourself that you can uh, force a retreat. So with that, uh, I probably don't want to carry on too much about it. Uh, hopefully by now, uh, over the last you know, five or six minutes, you've seen pictures up here. All yeah, right, so uh, there you go, Fort Blau, Compass Games. Check it out, uh, all uh, thereabouts. Talk to you soon. You know, the higher level core is here. All these guys belong to this core, all this army group. All these guys belong to the, another color for the, the guy.